Um, welcome everyone to the Environmental and Energy Law Society and Federalist Society joint event on climate change. My name is Michael Quirk. Uh, I'm the Vice President of the e and &E Law Society and a Vice President slash the Technology Officer of the Federalist Society and will be the moderator of this presentation. Uh, I also happen to have started a new media journalism 501c3 nonprofit uh, last year that is uh, endeavoring to do just this, which is uh, bring together renowned scientists to examine and explain the science of climate change to a non-scientist uh, audience. Uh, speaking for both societies, we are thrilled to have such distinguished and high-profile uh, speaker uh, scientists speak today on the most fundamental aspect uh, of the climate change issue, and that is uh, whether greenhouse gas emissions are the cause of global warming, and if so, to what extent. Our first speaker, Dr. John Nielsen Gammon, uh, close to me, um, is a guest speaker of the Environmental Energy Law Society, a student organization dedicated to creating awareness of current environmental matters and the legal issues surrounding them. Uh, the E&E &E Law Society mission is to encourage students and community members to support environmental initiatives and to integrate students with the local community and environmental profession. Uh, Dr. Nielsen Gammon is a state climatologist of Texas appointed by uh, then-Governor George W. Bush and Regents Professor at the Texas A&M University's Department of Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, Dr. Nielsen Newman received his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in meteorology from MIT, and in addition to teaching at Texas A&M, he spends much of his time crisscrossing the state to give reports, analyses, forecasts on the devastating drought uh, that is still continuing in many parts of Texas. Uh, Dr. Nielsen Gammon has published extensively on meteorology and climate change, including a geo uh, journal article entitled An Inconvenient Truth, The Scientific Argument. Uh, he was uh, recently featured in the Texas Monthly Issue on the Drought and has his own climate science blog called The Climate Abyss uh, on the Houston Chronicle website, cron.com. So please help me welcome Dr. Nielsen Gammon. And for our uh, second speaker, Dr. Willie Soon, uh, he will be the guest speaker of the Federalist Society, which is a group of uh, conservatives and libertarians that are interested in the current state of the legal order and advocate the following principles. And that is that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. Uh, Dr. Willie Soon is an astrophysicist and geoscientist at the Solar Stellar Physics Division of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He received his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate with distinction in astrophysics from the University of Southern California. And he is also receiving editor of the journal New Astronomy and has co-authored the book The Maunder and the Variable Sun-Earth Connection, uh, in addition to a, a range of papers on both astrophysics and the physics of climate change. Uh, he is the Chief Advisor to the Science and Public Policy Institute and has testified before Congress on the issue of climate change. And please help me welcome Dr. Uh, Willie Soon. As for the format of this, as for the format of this event, uh, this will be a dual presentation. Each speaker will have 12 minutes for a presentation. Uh, after both, pre pre pardon me, I'm trying to I'm going too fast here because uh, I know we're a little bit behind on time. After both presentations have been heard, each speaker will have an eight-minute rebuttal. Uh, a speaker can save his rebuttal time for a rebuttal to the rebuttal if he would like. Uh, I will give you all a two-minute warning uh, before your time has expired. Uh, and at the end of the presentations, uh, I'll ask the presenters a few prepared questions and then open the floor to uh, questions by the uh, audience. Uh, finally, before we start, as a general announcement, a class will be using this classroom immediately after, so we have to stick to a, a tight timeline, and if the students um, and guests could quickly uh, clear the room, uh, that'd be most appreciated because it leaves more time for uh, Q&A. All right, thank you again, and um, let's get started. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Federalist Society and the Environmental Law Society for inviting us here. Uh, we've got, still got about five or six chairs, so come on across the front before I start. You can have a good front and I'll try to uh, not take up all the 12 minutes, so we've got as much time for questions as possible. Probably because it's theoretically impossible to summarize all of my science in 12 minutes anyway, so I'm just going to hit one or two uh, key points, and we'll let the, the questions and discussion uh, take care of some of the rest. And uh, so the, the question that uh, posed uh, are man-made greenhouse gas emissions the cause of climate change. And so 
My answer is no. I'm eager to hear what Dr. Sue says. But uh, the reason I say it's no is because it's really an ill-posed question. Because climate is, is quite a, a, a complicated entity. And uh, perhaps a better question is, many greenhouse gas emissions a cause of climate change. And uh, that, is, that is definitely true. The, the physics of uh, how carbon dioxide, uh, methane, nitrous oxide interact with uh, radiation is well known. And I'll be explaining why that's important a little bit later in my talk. Uh, but this doesn't really get us anywhere because it doesn't indicate anything about the importance of the problem. So perhaps an even better question would be, uh, are greenhouse gas emissions the most important cause of climate change for the present day? And my answer to that, unfortunately, is it depends. Usually not. There's a lot of aspects of climate where greenhouse gas emissions are irrelevant or a very minor player. But there are some circumstances and time scales where it does matter, and matter a great deal. So that's what I want to explain to you here in, the, in my introductory remarks. So some of the things that we, that are firmly established scientific facts, man is causing a substantial increase in uh, most of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. Usually they're trace gases, they're a pretty small component of the atmosphere, and that's still the case. Now the trick is that most of the atmosphere is composed of gases like nitrogen and oxygen that are transparent to the radiation that's emitted by the Earth, so they don't have uh, a big effect on what happens to radiation after it's emitted by the Earth. Uh, but just about everything else does. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, etc. So if you change the concentration of these gases, uh, you're affecting the radiation balance. And it doesn't matter whether that's caused naturally or caused man-made or some combination of the two. It's inevitable that the radiation balance changes and the climate system has to respond and, as a result of that. So my, uh, my own cartoon diagram of the climate system. The, uh, uh, sun is that big yellow thing. You've probably seen it outside occasionally. Um, it's emitting solar radiation, uh, mostly in the range that we can actually see. Our eyes are adapted that, to that particular range of wavelengths of light. We can distinguish different wavelengths. Those are different colors that we can detect. Uh, sun's emitting radiation in all directions. Some of it's hitting the Earth, which is this uh, little, little thing here. I have, I have not drawn it to scale. If I were to draw it to scale, it would be, I think, uh, two buildings over and quite a bit smaller. Um, so we're getting just a tiny bit of what's emitted by the sun, which is good because the sun's uh, effective surface temperature is several thousand degrees Kelvin. If we were right up next to the sun, we'd be that warm also. As is, we, did, we get just enough radiation that the we are actually at a fairly mild temperature. We're at the, essentially the right distance from the sun and, and absorb the right percentage of radiation to actually be in that comfortable range that supports life between where water is frozen and where water is in gas form is boiled away. At our terrestrial temperatures, it supports a lot of liquid and liquid water is very good. Which reminds me, kind of thirsty. Wouldn't be able to do this on Venus. And most of the time, wouldn't be able to do it on Mars. Okay, so the Earth is getting its energy from the sun. Uh, it's, it's got a little bit of geothermal energy from, from radiation being emitted by radioactive compounds in the Earth, but 99.9 uh, some odd percent of the energy is coming from the sun. And the Earth, to stay at a constant temperature, is radiating energy away at about the same rate. And this is, this is the um, only scientific law that I'm going to talk about here in the, in the law school, um, no pun intended, um, that basically the, the uh, energy stored in an optic changes depending upon whether it's gaining more than it loses or loses more than it gains. And the neat thing about this is it's a stable system because the hotter the, the Earth gets, the more energy it, it radiates away and loses. And so 
if there's some sort of imbalance that is gaining heat energy, it'll warm up until eventually it's losing as much energy as it's gaining and it's found a new stable temperature. So that's the, the basics of it. The Earth is finds, finds, always constantly adjusting to find the temperature that allows it to be essentially in equilibrium with what it's gaining from the sun. It never actually reaches that equilibrium, but it's always being driven in that direction. The reason it doesn't reach that equilibrium is because the sun's energy changes, the, the weather and ocean patterns on the Earth change, and so forth. But that those differences amount to, again, less than 1% of the amount of energy the Earth is getting. Okay, the, everything is emitting, on the Earth's surface, is emitting radiation, which without an atmosphere would go out to space. But, as I mentioned, there are some gases that absorb and emit radiation. So the radiation escaping from space at some wavelengths is coming from those gases in the atmosphere rather than from the Earth's surface. In fact, uh, I think only about 5% of what gets emitted by the Earth actually manages to make it out to space. The rest of it is emitted from the atmosphere. This is a satellite image. It's a water vapor image, so-called. You sometimes see this on the TV weathercast. It's called this because it's showing radiation emitted by water vapor in the atmosphere. And this is the storm from Monday, the big snowstorm that hit the panhandle. And we can actually see clouds in this image because uh, clouds are, are, are either tiny droplets of water or ice crystals. And they, emit, they can emit in the, all the way across this range of wavelengths. So they're, the higher they are, uh, the cooler their temperature. And consequently, the smaller the amount of radiation they emit. They're so cold, they're, they're, they're emitting relatively weak radiation. And we can tell that they're high in the atmosphere as a result of that, because in most of the atmosphere, temperature decreases with height. So we've got high clouds here. Down below, we're actually looking at not clouds, but the water vapor itself, the invisible gas form of water. And there happens to be very little water vapor down here in South Texas. It's not summer yet. And consequently, um, actually, we're getting emissions down where the water vapor, on average, is about minus 10 degrees Celsius <laughs> compared to here, where there's a lot of water vapor, we're only saying the top part of that water vapor, where it's a lot colder, about minus 30, minus 40. We use this for weather forecasting to, to, to initialize the forecasting models of distribution of water vapor. Um, carbon dioxide does the same thing. Uh, you can still see the clouds, like you did in the other image, because those are still emitting at this wavelength. Uh, but you don't see those fancy patterns because Unlike water vapor, carbon dioxide is fairly evenly distributed through the atmosphere. It varies by maybe 10 to 20 percent from place to place rather than by two orders of magnitude. And so the, you're basically looking at carbon dioxide in a, a layer near the upper troposphere, about 5 to 10 miles up. And the variations actually give you a sense of where the atmosphere is cold at that altitude and where the atmosphere is warm. And this gets used to, to actually initialize weather forecasting models to get the temperature distribution in the atmosphere. Okay, so what happens if you change the amount of these gases, water, vapor, carbon dioxide, what have you? Basically, the emissions going out to space end up coming from higher up in the atmosphere, where the temperature is cooler. And so you're emitting less radiation at that wavelength than before. That creates an energy imbalance. The Earth gains heat. And the Earth system responds on average by getting warmer so that the emissions to space can increase again and strike a new balance. And that's the basic physics of not just uh, man-induced climate change, but lots of uh, factors in climate change. Change the energy balance, climate response. So, key factors here, um, basically I wanted to leave you with, uh, you can analyze globally average climate change based on uh, how much the energy changes due to some particular change in the climate system. That's radiative forcing. 
And secondly, how much the climate responds to that change. And that's uh, called climate sensitivity. How much the temperature changes in response to that change in radiation. And as it turns out, calculating radiation forcing from carbon dioxide or from snow cover change is easy. Estimating sensitivity is hard. And right now, we've got to pin down to maybe only about uh, a range of about a factor of two. We can estimate sensitivity from all sorts of past changes in climate. We can estimate it from the recent changes in climate. We can estimate it from future changes in climate based on climate models. And right now, the best bet for, say, a, a doubling of carbon dioxide concentrations is a change of about two and a half to three degrees Celsius. Getting back to my question, the reason this matters sometimes not others is just carbon dioxide is changing slowly. If you look at the past 10 years of global temperatures, there's a lot of ups and downs caused by a lot of different factors. Uh, those straight lines indicate the range of change that would be due to carbon dioxide alone. And you can see on this time scale, it's not supposed to have much effect. If you look at a longer time scale, like the past 40 years or so, it is a, a bigger effect, still not necessarily the dominant one. But the thing about it compared to natural variability is, well, natural variability causes temperature to go up and down. You keep increasing carbon dioxide, temperature keeps going up. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and uh, indeed I want to thank uh, Professor John Nelson Gummon for making such a good introduction to the topic of uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor and clouds and so on to produce this uh, greenhouse effect. There's nothing that he says that I would disagree with, except for one small little point. Even simple facts about what a diatomic molecule, meaning nitrogen or oxygen, can have actually sensitivity to absorbing infrared radiation because, simply because there are a large amount of it. That it depends again. It, if you look at the places like continent like Antarctica, it is important actually for nitrogen and oxygen even compared to let's say methane for example as a greenhouse absorber of the radiation. That's just a small little correction to have a whole truth in the story. I'll start with this slide by just that Dr. Nelson Garman has also shown. The red curve is of course showing you the temperature curve and then the black curve was actually trying to tell you something about the rising carbon dioxide uh, concentration. There is no doubt that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So if you have more of it, it will produce the greenhouse effect, right? But I won't go into too much details, but probably you can take a hint that, well, it kind of go up and then, you know, somehow something really not right near the end of it. This is the kind of very popular in the media to try to say now the global warming has stopped. I really think that it's somewhat true actually. If you look carefully at the last, you know, from about year 2000 or so, that thing's going up and down. Remember, the CO2 going up is still substantial. It's rather large actually. If you want to calculate the forcing, go ahead and calculate it. But the point is that how come it's not doing anything to the, to the system in terms of measuring the global temperature. But temperature is a very interesting thing of course. But it's not as interesting as actually measuring something like this called the ocean heat content. Okay, because Dr. Nelson has explained to you that you will add heat to the system. Okay? In fact, CO2 is not adding heat, actually it just prevents the Earth system from able to cool itself very much more efficiently than it would otherwise be. So I'm showing you this chart of what they call the ocean heat content measurement. Basically, the total volume of the heat that's contained from zero to about 700 meters down. Okay. You can see it's going up and down, and then somehow by 2000 or 2001 or so, boom, shoot up, and then this thing is somewhat flat, actually. And the error bar are pretty much reasonable error bar. In science, of course, when you talk about a measurement, you got to have how much uncertainty of your measurement is. And I think that is very, very important. Okay. You can look at this data, you can make somewhat a lot of interpretation. But it is a somewhat reasonable data that I think everybody agrees this is something that we we'll look at to try to ask the question. Where does the heat go that is coming from this increase in CO2 radiation? Now I want to zoom in on a period that is about something from about 2003. Please don't accuse me for cherry picking anything. The only reason why you go for 2003 is because since that time, we really truly have that kind of a global 
volume sample of the world ocean. That's a very remarkable achievement of scientific studies, by the way. This whole data set, you know, since about 2000, costs you about $250 million by now, because each one of those measurements that go down from the surface, you basically have a float in the ocean that go down to about depth of 2,000 meters. We will talk about only the 700 meters for the very simple reason, not because you're trying to hide data from <coughs> 700 to 2,000. It's just the calibration and the sensor there are not very good quality, okay, the measurement. So let's talk about the best quality where we can study that. So if you look at the data since about 2003 or so, and then going through about as long as we have the data, right about 2012. <coughs> then you can see this thing is going up and down. Don't, don't mind the trend line, it doesn't mean anything really. It's just statistically insignificant. But the point is that if you look at what is actually being predicted by adding more of this CO2, remember CO2 is a greenhouse gas, right? It will add heat to the system. It cannot all of a sudden take, take a vacation. The temperature could do this and then cool a little bit. But heat is a very, this ocean heat, this heat content is a very powerful measurement. <coughs> the thing cannot just suddenly take vacation. I would just take it from here that because that the model predicted that the total heat content in the system has to increase and we're not seeing an increase, all we can say is that basically not saying that the greenhouse effect of CO2 is not there, it's just saying that we're not seeing it. Okay? That's something very uh, not comfortable especially for people who want to propose that CO2 is somewhat of an important greenhouse gas that can <coughs> really cause a, a significant climate change. There's another way to do this. In science, I'm just trying to show the, the way to go about this. This is basically an idea about saying that CO2 is, is very sensitive in very specific wavelengths of the climate system. <coughs> and let me just show you where it is, of course. So you have a, a radiation staying on top of the planet Earth, uh, uh, of Earth, right? Way up there, the satellite way up there, and then you look down. And then you see what kind of emission coming from the, from the planet, right? And I just want to point to that feature, of the famous feature that the lands CO2, this particular name, satanic gas, right? 666, right now that using this wave number of things. So the idea now is that let's try to focus in. What kind of information do we have? By the way, doing this kind of measurement, imagine that the real test is like, let's measure this for 100 years, right? But it's really a difficult measurement, okay? Because you have to resolve all the wavelength individuals and kind of monitor it. Because to me, if you can see that thing, it's the ultimate definitive proof. <laughs> CO2 is doing it, boy, let's go do some, if it's dangerous, of course, that's another problem. But let's look at it. This is actually, there is such a data set exists, okay, from two satellite missions. One is US, one is Japanese. <coughs> this Jap the US one is a Nimbus 4 satellite, so actually in 1970s, they did a very careful measurement. And then the Japanese one is an ADL satellite that flew in 96 and 97. So they actually take taken measurements. Here, because again, we don't have worldwide sampling, so we can cover only tropical ocean, okay? 20 north to 20 south. And I just want to focus on that feature. This is what the climate model simulation says. Because from 97 to, to 1970, you actually increase the CO2, so the emission temperature in this unit actually ought to decrease, okay? In, in that wavelength. That's what the model says. And then here's what the observation, the actual observation from the two satellite missions, right? To me, it, what this tells you is that, again, we are really having a hard time, actually. I, I'm having a hard time to convince myself. I'm not saying that this is a definite proof that CO2 is nothing, but all I'm saying is that, hey, we're not seeing it, okay? And I'm having trouble accepting all these ideas about CO2, and then you re literally translate into something about radiative forcing. Those are useful concepts to teach classroom, but the Earth is a very dynamic system. Then I don't think that treating the problem as a radiation problem is a, is a solution to the answer, actually. It's in fact one of the usual stories about how, how that you can use this to do this. So I want to remind, <coughs> remind everybody about science. That's what it's all about. The, 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 the rule of the game is very simple, actually. Okay? If you have the evidence, just show it. If it's true, I will accept it. If I say something wrong, I'll admit it's wrong. That's all it is. No if or buts about that. Okay? So this statement by Einstein is very, very useful to remind ourselves. What game are we in here? We're in a scientific game, not a political game. It doesn't matter what Al Gore says, okay? Or how much he breathes out. But the problem is, you really, really need to treat this experimental test very seriously. Because no amount of experiment, experimentation can ever prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong, okay? Let me move on. I want to make a strong criticism of CO2, uh, of, uh, not CO2, but the way that how CO2 game is being played, essentially they say that, oh, even if you don't see it now, it's the next hundred years, it's going to happen. 
that's, that's basically the game. That's why you have sensitivity, you have this climate model projection endlessly projecting everywhere. That I think it doesn't make sense. We've got to stop this insensible nonsense. Here's another way to look at this. What is the problem in the climate model? This is now simulation from 24 climate models from all over the world, listed over there. 72 simulations, each one of them done about three runs. And then what I want to do there is that the most simplest question you can demand or ask what the climate model can do is that how, can it, how well can it measure or produce this annual seasonal cycle. Okay? And on this axis here is basically the amplitude of this thing changing over time from 1954 to 2000, the trend of it. From that axis is basically the phase, the timing of, let's say, spring, arrival of spring, not an atmosphere spring, for example, like early or later. That's zero, right? So these are model values. They're all over the place. Okay? And you ask yourself, where's the observation goes? It's right there. Okay. Remember, we're not asking the model to do too much, really. All we're asking them to do is that how well can it produce this annual seasonal cycle? That's all I want to know. Okay? Doesn't matter what fight, what party you want, but the point is that they, I'm not very happy with the ability of this climate model. Why would I use this model to project something 100 years from now? Okay? I would not. Here's the reason. Here's another way to look at this, which is to ask yourself how well the, the climate model, which I would we stand, uh, use it as the nomenclature GCM, general circulation models, and on the right there is basically observation, the French project, right, Calypso. This is the measurements they do in terms of the cloud fraction, okay, from about nothing to about 40%, from South Pole to North Pole over there, minus 90 to plus 90 over there, positive, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, showing you the distribution versus height, okay, in terms of the cloud amount available. Okay. And then on the right here is basically the simulation by the climate model. I mean, if half truth is always reasonable to try to propagate something uh, about policy, I, I don't think it works that way, actually. I don't like it a bit that you use climate model that is so flawed, that you know so flawed, to try to make any more guesses about what, what and what not. Okay? And here's another way that how commonly <coughs> even a very prestigious person, don't mind me, this is not a common, just simply because it's a public statement. He has a responsibility for making such a statement. Of course, he's a Nobel Prize physicist from... Uh, from uh, Rice University for making that statement, right? That all this model is not about one single model result, it's all this group of results that actually average them and then kind of uh, give reasonable results, okay? So he's trying to say that maybe we should treat this model result seriously. I say no, 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 not at all, okay? Which I would say maybe we should ask this simple question. If you have all these jets here, you know, maybe we should ask what is the average passenger jet will look like, right? It's a bit fuzzy, maybe fuzzy math, okay? <laughs> That's the kind of problem that I have with this, this kind of approach and this kind of loud thinking, which I think is not very useful actually, because it's not very useful at all. It's just, in fact, in fact it's just very bad if you want to make policy out of this. I end with this small little story. This is something very alarming, which I hope Dr. Nelson will agree with. This is the usual standard technique of how IPCC, United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or, or even later I'll talk about the US EPA or the US National whatever Global Climate Change Research Program. There are so many groups that I cannot keep count of them. But here's the standard picture. They say, well, observation is the black curve, right? And then model is all this yellow stuff. And then the mean of that model is basically the, the red curve. It looks pretty <coughs> impressive if you put all the factors in. Right, CH4, CFC, what have you, CO2, right, the sun, they even know about the sun, by the way, and then volcano, they got all of that in. Oh, beautiful, it's very well. And then when you don't put the CO2 forcing in, this is one, only putting natural forcing, meaning only from volcano or the sun, that you have such a result. Very remarkable that nothing goes up, nothing comes up. So, you know, therefore, the conclusion is that CO2 has to do it, right? I say that, be careful. This is actually a trick. Very dangerous trick that should never ever be done. In fact, all of the students in here will be flung if you show such a result to me. Okay. Okay. So here's what reality is. Those are temperature anomaly, absolute scale, all the model results. They don't group into one little nice plot. This is the kind of plot that actually very hard to find because it's never been published officially. There's only one paper so far that I got that has been published that shows such an honest result. Do you understand what I'm just showing you? They're collapsing all the results that is not really true to show that what the model can do. The model is in terrible state, okay? I'm sorry. It's all over the place. It doesn't mean anything, okay? Here's the problem with US EPA. EPA is even smarter. 
they turn a result that is actually in anomalous unit temperature. Okay, this is a simplified form of the version that we saw. Okay, and they turn it into absolute units here, without realizing that you could not possibly do that. The original plot came from this UN IPCC report summary plot. Okay, showing you the natural stuff and then the one that you had man-made emission. It looks good. Okay, but it's completely not true because the actual result in absolute scale of the model looks like this, not like this. Okay, and then the EPA. Undoubtedly, it's a political entity. Look at that. They say this is one of the important evidence, right? That shows that greenhouse gas is causing the global warming. <coughs> so it's terrible, actually, that when you get such soon, uh, You're two minutes over, and I'm taking out your bubble time. Okay, so I'm done. <laughs> experimental, there's no experimental data that can support the views. Is uh, uh, Earth is changing in a dangerous manner by CO2. And then CO2, in my view, is just a big player in the climate change. And it's no doubt that this control norm of CO2 it's just pure illusion, it's so far so far as I'm concerned, because I just don't see it. And then finally, if you really want to play the game of, uh, don't, don't worry about it now, we don't see it, it's okay, but next hundred years, okay? Then I just say that this climate model is simply not that kind of tool that you imagine that it can do. Mainly it has the problem of representing the full physics, chemistry, and biology of the Earth system, okay? Especially related to something called the water. Very simple subject, right? And not in any particular form of these gases. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Let me let me take away the takeaway message. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, I I wish yeah I wish I had opportunity to see Dr. Chin's slides because I would have brought along satellite data showing that there's less radiation being emitted from the wavelengths that are come from carbon dioxide and the ones that are correspond to the atmospheric window. Um, in fact, the slide he showed, if you look closely at it, you see that there's a, there's a dip in the CO2 range compared to the range nearby. And the rest of it, which is down, is corresponds to where water vapor should also be showing an increase. You don't just expect to see a fingerprint of CO2. You expect to see it in CO2 and everything, every other gas that's increasing, including water vapor. Um, let's see. So um, I agree with the the uh, ocean heat concept that uh, that's a key factor for looking at, car at uh, climate change. It's going up now, not as rapidly as it was before. Sort of along the lines of the way the temperature of the Earth's going up rapidly, not as much as it was before. Um, he mentioned we also have measurements from 700 meters down to 2,000. They show the temperature going up uh, more rapidly than zero to 700, but not as rapidly as before. Um, and all of that points to the fact, not that CO2 doesn't do anything, but there are a lot of things that affect climate. We have CO2, we have aerosols, we have solar energy, we have volcanoes. Sun's, sun's output's been fairly low the past few years compared to the early part of the decade, for example. So, um, in fact, the biggest factor based on uh, past history of the Earth that's affecting the current temperatures, I sort of alluded to this, let me put my slides back up, is, is natural variability. Um, and specifically, the biggest factor in that is El Nino and La Nina. Um, let's see. So you saw, let's see, you saw both of us put up this slide. Um, or something like it. Except, if you look closely, there is, there is a diff there is a, there is a difference in these graphs. Um, Dr. Soon put up, well, he, he showed from 1990 or so to the present, was it? What time? 1980. Okay. Um, and he showed temperature anomaly on one side and CO2 concentration on the other. And CO2 was going up like that, temperature was going up like that. Well, CO2 was going up like that, temperature was going up like that. And on my graph, temperature is going up like that and CO2 is going up like that. So, what's the right scale? Well, what I've done is I've taken the CO2 concentration increase, uh, converted that to the corresponding change in temperature based upon the current best estimates of climate sensitivity to see what impact of temperature that carbon dioxide should have had. And when you do the right uh, calibration, it actually matches up. But that match is just an accident because of all the other things that affect climate. It just so happens that this one forcing factor, carbon dioxide, happens to correspond fairly well to the actual overall change in temperature because over that particular time interval, everything else has pretty much canceled out. Um, focusing on the more recent time, um, 
the, uh, where we got not much change in those unique content and so forth. Um, what's been happening, uh, that seems to be the, the cause of this, is um, changes in basically El Nino and La Nina, as I mentioned. Uh, when you have an El Nino event, which is warm water in the tropical Pacific, that tends to raise global temperatures uh, with a time lag of about a few months. La Nina tends to cool it down. And you can estimate that effect statistically based on the, the past uh, 40, 50 years of data. You don't even need climate models for that. And if you, if you do that correction, you find the region that's been cold for 2011 to 2012, well, I said cold. The reason it's been much warmer than the past century, but not way much warmer than the past century, is because we've had two La Ninas in a row. And I've got on record in my blog that because we are expecting neutral conditions and based on the past correlation between temperature and uh, El Nino, that this year, 2013, based on the standard surface temperature compilations, will be the warmest year on record. So if you don't know who to believe now, there'll be one bit of evidence next year that you can look back at. <coughs> um, let's see, finally, um, you, I don't have enough time and the time available to defend climate models, so I certainly won't say that they're all tremendously accurate. I, I'll note that, uh, as I said at the beginning, the Earth finds its own equilibrium temperature. And each model, as you saw from Dr. Sitton's presentation, <laughs> comes up with a different surface equilibrium, which is going to depend upon its, the, the own model's climate, how much cloud it has, and so forth. And that's going to be different from model to model. There's no law of physics that says what that temperature is supposed to be. The law of physics I mentioned says that for that to change, there has to be a change of energy. And so that's why we look at climate models for looking at changes in climate more so than simulating the actual calibrated exact temperature of climate the present day. Climate models have lots of uses. Some of them are misuses. Um, there, there's way too much reliance on details and projections, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the projections for precipitation in Texas, for example, are in one direction, climate records in another direction. But you can throw climate models completely out the window, and you're still left with the basic physics confirmed with observations. The CO2 affects radiation, radiation affects temperature, and all we know about past climate says you change radiation, temperature changes also. Two minutes. Uh, that's fine, thank you. Would you like to say your about time? Yes. We've got Dr. Uh, Shane, you have five minutes and uh, All right. seconds. The doctor, no, three minutes. Okay, that's fine. Well, I really don't have much more to add. I appreciate uh, Dr. Nelson for being kind and then sort of show his result. That is somewhat interesting that he said that he could convert the increase in CO2 concentration into some temperature unit. I say, let's do something even more challenging. Let's convert that into the ocean heat content. Things is even better, actually. Why do you not do that if you can do that? That's the point. And I really think that there's not much that we disagree. I truly only want to convey the message, as far as I'm concerned. Perhaps maybe you can clarify. Uh, are you actually suggesting that with this result that you're saying that you have seen now the impact of CO2 in the planet's data, uh, uh, global temperature data? Are you actually saying that? From, from simply analyzing the history of temperature, you cannot conclude that. Okay. I'm saying, but the weight of evidence, you can. Fair enough. So we don't really have the, the, the proof, isn't it? We don't have the evidence to suggest that. All I'm saying is that every attempt that I try to look at the impact of the CO2, be it temperature, precipitation, droughts, or even on El Nino or Enso variability, you really don't see this information, okay? That's why maybe if I have time, I, I, I just show one more thing about, again, this is just not my personal beef, which I, I just think that the topic is important to clarify, which is basically uh, simple things like, like this, actually, because <coughs> I think this chart will be very helpful. Again, okay? what I'm trying to show you is basically <coughs> measurements, actual satellite measurements of the sea surface temperature from the tropics, 20 north, 20 south, showing you from about 98 or so to about 2012. And it's showing you the raw data going up and down. Okay? And then there are people who attempt to say that, oh, because El Nino is dominating the tropical ocean, so we produce that curve, okay? the corrected one. And then if you ask yourself again, how much does the model predict the warming? 
Again, this is model produced output rather than what he showed you that he can scale this number, which I, I really would have appreciated that you can have time to check those numbers because it looks a bit too un not real to me. That is not correct. Because if you look at this output that actually from computer model, which is supposed to be the best tool, and it's showing that increase only on the you know on in your region. Okay? This amplitude is a whole lot, whole lot larger than what is actually being observed. Again, it's not to challenge anything, but I think that we have to be careful to check our numbers too. I kind of don't quite, I cannot debunk him, but I just say, you know, let's be careful. Let's, let's be very careful with the number. It shows you again, the climate model is exaggerating what the actual observation is. By the way, there's no tricks of trying to pick the beginning time of this particular satellite observation of the ocean, because it's just the time that it started in 1998. That's all the data we have, all the data you show it. That's about it. And I think maybe I'll stop now and save some time to, to, to okay. take any of your questions. A little bit less than two minutes for uh, rebuttal. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just uh, so I try to just summarize the, the difference of opinion that you can, if you're interested in it, go off on your own and look up. First issue, is there evidence in the spectrum observed from space? <laughs> that uh, emissions from, from CO2 wavelengths are changing compared to other wavelengths. Look that up, decide for yourselves. Um, has there been um, a uh, variation in a frequency of El Nino La Nina that's affecting ocean heat content and temperatures? You can like, look that up for yourself. Um, do climate models go through periods of natural variability where not only does global temperature level off temporarily, but uh, uh, ocean heat content level off at the same time. Check that for yourself. And uh, finally, um, the calibration of CO2 versus temperature. I'll just put that back up so you can see the numbers. Uh, Dr. Sue wants to check it. You can check it too. Um, the predict the. Uh, okay, so the. Uh, whoops. So the, the rate due to CO2 alone is going from about, um, uh, about the 0.5 to 0.6 degrees Celsius over uh, what we have here, a 35-year period. So that's um, about somewhere between 0.15 and 0.2 degrees mm -hmm. Celsius per decade. So that's the rate that will be due to CO2 alone based on known sensitivities. Look that up. Um, again, um, there's a lot else that's affecting climate. If you want to make, make a climate forecast, you really do have to take it all into account, and it's not just CO2. Thank you. Well, you know what? I have not much more to say because all these numbers may actually make you a bit headache by now, but it's important. The message is important. Check. Please check all of the, this, this, these statements and all, everything that we say and then if there's anything unclear, of course, please feel free to write to us. Uh, I'm sure that we'll do our best to answer any question that is confusing to you and so on and so forth. Well, it's probably best to write both of us. <laughs> yes, yes, it is, so that we see it. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just say... Okay, start with uh, uh, well, let's just be quick on the Q&A. Uh, I'll start with them. Um, First off, I saw that the scales were short on the CO2 and temperature anomalies. Uh, and I was wondering if y'all would speak about the Michael Mann's hockey stick curve, which um, some of y'all might be familiar with in the audience. Uh, we learned about environmental uh, law, which is from uh, 200 uh, AD, I guess, to 2000 in its original. And just wondering if, if both of you could speak on whether it's credible or not, or is it strengthened over time or not? And what does that tell us um, about what's in store for the future? Uh, I guess we'll start with Dr. Nissan. Okay. Um, I don't think the hockey stick from 1988 is credible anymore. Um, there were there were flaws in the methodology. Um, there's been a lot of reconstructions and improvements done since then. One thing problem it had was it actually suppressed uh, the variability from decade to decade and century to century. So it looked like a straight line plus another straight line. Uh, people have done different, used different techniques, some that actually will maximize the multi-decade variability to see what was going on back then. Um, the, basic, the basic picture we have right now is that uh, 
uh, the average temperature back when it was, I guess, warmest medieval war period is, is in the neighborhood of, of what it is uh, today over the past uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, and that, that basic idea hasn't changed, um, although, again, we've, got, we've, we've restored some of the medieval war period from what the original hockey stick showed. And uh, I'll just skip because if it lacks credibility with you, I'm sure it lacks credibility with Dr. Stern. <laughs> Well, right. I may have a different conclusion at this point uh, based on the window. Well, I was hoping if Dr. Schoen could answer the second part of the question of uh, uh, what's in store if we continue uh, the status quo in terms of emissions. I'm, I'm very sorry. In science, the rule is that you don't project until you understand everything. You okay. don't, that's my basic rule. I don't want to predict anything. As a, as Especially as climate temperature. That's, that's the most dangerous thing you could do. Use any tool you want. I as a like gambler, man. <laughs> <or a grandson. laughs> um, should I change my behavior, or speaking of as a nation or, or a world, oh. because there's risk. It's, it's uncertainty, I know. And oh, I, I couldn't presume to tell you what to do. That's all I'm trying to say. All I'm trying to say is that that is huge misrepresentation. I don't know actually the issue is worthy of discussion or not. All I know is that then the idea, okay, in, in my view, the idea to try to suggest then we all should somehow, quote unquote, control this emission of carbon dioxide, right, that we human can produce. It's ridiculous in my view, because to do what exactly? I actually had the privilege of asking Mr. Go myself this question. I say, you told me that I have a brain cancer, right? And then you try to chop off my arms and cut my things and legs, I'm like, you know, blood all over the place. You won't allow me to do a CT scan. And I want to get other people to ask Okay, anyway, so we're not going to get anything out of it. I'll just tell you, Dr. Nielsen, speak to that. I mean, regulation is hard. Uh, you know, transitioning to different power sources, and I mean, it's, yeah, I, I it's hard. Is it worth sure. it? I mean, well, I can't, I can't presume to say what well, you do also because I'm just a scientist, not, a, not an economist or an engineer or so forth. I can just tell you the things that I worry about from a scientific point of view. Not just the amount by which temperature might change, but the rate at which it's changing is another issue. Um, and and the it, it, it's not just an economic trade-off between how much it will cost to deal with the changes in the weather and changes in, in the climate, but also um, I think just just uh, just religiously we have a responsibility to take care of the earth and not do things that that, it, that uh, endanger it in terms of throwing it out of balance. So I'd be a lot more comfortable if we had carbon dioxide on a reasonably constrained track rather than its uh, continued increase. I give you one example on that yeah, issue. Uh, on the rate of change, that I'm is not sorry, a fair thing to say that uh, it's a big concern because answer? we have seen it before. Uh, uh, go ahead. At least in the recent so thousand to six thousand years. Uh, I think our nation faces a big question about how much we're willing to take a hit on our economy to control CO2 as a way of controlling global temperatures. Do you think that we understand the problem well enough to expend a significant amount of our national economy on controlling CO2 emissions. Who's first? I say straight no. Okay. I'll, I'll say we're going to have to deal with a non-carbon economy sooner or later anyway. We may as well start developing the technology. Oh, I want to finish on the top of a rate of warming and cooling and all that stuff. All I'm saying is that empirical evidence we have for thousands or extending 6,000 years ago, I mean, these are clearly that the rate that we're seeing now is nothing alarming. That's why I use the word that is not anomalous. Just give a very concrete example. If you look at actually, uh, well, 1920s and 30s, okay? The, the, if you go to, basically, let's go to Upper Navi, northwest of Greenland right now. You try to go there, see whether you can find uh, sharks or cod caught fish around that area. It's too cold. It's not there. Today, if you go there. But in the 30s and 20s, there are reports of those things seeing that. All I'm trying to say, if you want to see how the push of the extreme, even the most recent, you know, All right. well, we're 80 years time. history, uh, we've already seen it. Right? I, I it was much warmer than that. Uh, we started out and there's a class waiting uh, outside. Thank you very much.